Hi, Erin. Hi, Renee. Okay, I'm going to start with the same questions that I've asked everybody so far. Um, do you consider yourself to be a data scientist, and what's your position right now? Um, yes, I consider myself to be a data scientist, uh, and I'm a senior data scientist right now at a company called Zymergen. Okay, great. And we'll come back to that. We're going to talk a lot more about that. But first, I want to go back to when you were a kid. So I saw in your bio that you got your degree in bioinformatics. Was yep. there anything early on that made you um, have that informatics side of it? <laughs> you know, were you super interested in science or math, or did you program early or anything like that in your childhood? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I was super interested in school, period. Uh, at all, like ever, actually, now that I think about it, but particularly <laughs> not when I was a kid. Uh, so no, I, I guess not. Um, however, I did have a really, uh, my, uh, my uncle, uh, my mom's brother, um, watched me a lot and she went back to school when I was a kid and um, he was big time into computers. And so uh, there used to be CompUSA in the 90s. And so he used to uh -huh. take me out to, um, to the computer store and we bought components and built computers together. Um, when I was growing up and so my first uh, interactions with computers were and I was a kid pre-internet too um, Were really building them. So I was always a lot more into um, hardware kind of stuff than than coding and software Okay, great and was CompUSA like a big, you know Superstore that you would just wander around like I did as a kid. And yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of like uh, Well, yeah, I guess it was kind of like Best Buy but specifically for computer stuff. So I remember once he came over and surprised me with a, a CD-ROM, which was like this drive that was, you know, three inches tall probably and like super heavy. Um, but uh -huh. I was so excited because I had all these games um, on CD that I had bought, like used, and I had no way to play them because I didn't have a CD-ROM. So we put that in and yeah, so CompUSA is definitely a relic. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty What cool are some game. examples of games you played? Oh man, oh, I played a lot of Doom. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved first-person shooters. Um, yeah, and then a lot of Genesis games. Cool. Okay, so you mentioned you didn't really like school as a whole, but kind of take us through your academic career. Like, what kind of classes did you take in high school that set you up for your the rest of your career, and why did you choose bioinformatics in college? Yeah, um, yeah. This is it, like for somebody who doesn't like school, this is kind of like a long story, I guess. Um, but because sure. I was in school for a really long time. Um, but yeah, I, I basically didn't care at all about school until about ninth grade um, when I, I didn't care and in fact performed very poorly in school until ninth grade um, when I went, I started high school and like it was basically a new school um, and met a lot of people that I hadn't met before and kind of fell into a, a really rough crowd of nerds. Uh, who valued different things than I did. Uh, and so to conform with my crowd, uh, I ended up taking, I, I became interested in what they were interested in. They were mostly interested in music and math. Um, and so that's what I did. And I was always very interested in music and had been playing music for a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I just, I started pursuing it. And then it turned out like, I, I didn't really feel ever like I was particularly gifted at math or uh, quantitative things, but I did really enjoy it. And I like uh, kind of unraveling things and understand how, understanding how things work or describing things um, with math. And so I don't think I really appreciated it while I was learning that and kind of uh, investing in those skills in high school and in college, but uh, it ended up being super important and uh, super valuable to my career. So yeah, high school, I kind of turned my act around, I think. Uh, and uh, started studying that math primarily. And then in college, I, uh, I did about my bachelor's in economics and evolutionary biology because my second year into college, I kind of had this, because I had planned, you know, I had my future planned out, so I was going to do like a PhD and become an economist. And then I just had like this waking dream almost of like myself as a 40-year-old uh, being an economist still and I was I just I couldn't do it like I just didn't it didn't feel like the, the thing I was meant to be doing um, And what school were you at? I was at Case Western Reserve um, in Cleveland, Ohio Okay, uh, which is a really small uh, really small uh, private school and mostly a technology school um, Had like a history of being a tech school and it still 
while it's not officially, it's like pr predominantly engineering and still a very uh, technology heavy school. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of a bummer. I didn't actually study um, like computer science or something while I was there, but uh, tons of math and tons of statistics for my economics degree. Um, and then when I, uh, about my freshman and sophomore year at Case, I started getting really interested in evolutionary biology. Um, and in particular, uh, the types of things that you could model or mostly ecology, I guess, with math. Um, and I saw a lot of overlap between um, the game theory that I was learning in economics and then uh, the models that the, those similar models that you can apply to uh, biology and that was really exciting to me um, because I liked the domain of biology better but I liked the math of economics um, and so from there I got a I got an internship uh, the summer of my I think junior year between my junior and senior year at case at the NIH um, in the division of computational biosciences and I worked with a guy there who's a mathematician named uh, James Malley and he's the person who kind of who introduced me to machine learning uh, and I, I used it during my internship and and just kind of the field of mathematical biology in general and, and of statistical biology um, and I was hooked basically I loved working with him and I loved that my summer there and I worked on really amazing stuff I'm amazed that they let me work on the stuff I did honestly uh, when I think about it it was an amazing experience um, so for, people for people that aren't, that aren't in familiar with bioinformatics Tell us what that is. You know, what do you study? What are you piecing together? And what are the machine learning projects that you did? Yeah, uh, it's kind of hard to answer about bioinformatics um, in general, but uh, at a very high level, bioinformatics, I think, is the intersection of uh, computer science and the biological sciences. Um, so unlike, not unlike um, data science, it's one of these fields where it's kind of hard to pin down what the skill sets are and the people who are in the field because it's so interdisciplinary. Um, so in a, and sometimes like a bioinformatic, a bioinformatician uh, might be kind of an information science uh, person, or in my case, I did more of uh, what's called systems biology, which is uh, more mathematically representing biology and doing mod like, like modeling and prediction um, at a systems level. So instead of uh, kind of a reductionist approach, more like step back, look at the whole system and, and try to understand that computationally. So that's a little bit different than what a, a typical bioinformatician might be, but it's a, again, a pretty interdisciplinary field. So it kind of hard, it's hard to say. Um, what kind of data are you looking at for that? Is it about, you know, organs functioning or is it about species or, you know, what are you looking at there? Yeah, it could be anything, but I focus mostly on molecular stuff. So I was looking largely when I was at the NIH, I was looking at a lot of sequence, so DNA sequence, uh, and looking for patterns there. And in particular, I was doing a lot of um, uh, comparative genomics, so looking at genomes from all kinds of different species and trying to find commonalities and differences in certain regions that might be associated with differences in function. Wow. So do, does the data for genomics, is it just, you know, like what we see in the movies, long sequences of ATGC kind of code? <laughs> that's definitely not, like, that's not far out. Uh, that's, yeah, I mean, largely, so you have, um, you have, you know, the sequence, which is, which is literally, you know, you have four things to work with, and you just have a big long sequence uh, that represents your genome. But there's also a lot of work that's been done uh, since the beginning of, uh, and even before that, the Human Genome Project to, to build annotations of the genome. So, uh, you know, it's not super useful to have the sequence if you don't know where things stop and start. And so since we've had all these sequences, we realize that there are, um, there are repeating components that, are, that do have certain functions like a, that will tell a transcription machinery to stop or, or to start reading something and then to stop. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that we call junk DNA that I, I'm, I suspect is just stuff we don't know, we don't understand. Um, so there's all kinds of pieces of this sequence that contextualize what that sequence is and what it, what it's actually doing. And so uh, mostly when you're, at least from my perspective or my experience, when you're working with genomic stuff, sequence is just one, one part of the data that you're looking at. You're looking at a lot of annotations and descriptions of, of what that sequence represents also, and then measurements of things. Oh, that's interesting. So um, when I first learned about you, I read about you in Data Scientists at Work. It's a book by Sebastian Gutierrez for people that haven't read it yet. It's a great book. Check it out. 
and they were talking about your work at Nordstrom. So how did you go from bioinformatics to retail data science? Yeah, uh, well, I wish that I had uh, a more interesting reason, um, but it was largely because I uh, had student debt from undergrad <laughs> and I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't stay on the, the traditional academic route. I couldn't, I couldn't do a, like a postdoc and then you know, shoot for a faculty position just because the, the salaries are so low and it's really yeah. quite a, a gamble um, on whether that actually even pans out for you. So I needed to get, I needed to get that in order first. So I, I started looking into data science. I, I had a friend who um, was in my master's program with me. I have my master's is in um, biostatistics. So I had a friend who graduated the same year as me from that program and then went out to San Francisco and became a data scientist. And when I was trying to find jobs and like, I don't even know what I'm gonna do. I have this weird skill set. I have a very quantitative skill set that I think is generalizable, but it's a, in a very uh, restricted domain. And so I, I didn't really know what I, what I was gonna do with that. Uh, and she told me to look into to data science. So I started looking into it um, and I had heard really good things about the Nordstrom Innovation Lab uh, and was kind of interested in, in that group. And then um, they, they called me and told me that they were, they were doing the same kind of model of having this like really small uh, specialized team at Nordstrom, but they're gonna focus on data and data science. And would I be interested in doing that? And I was like, well, yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, so yeah, it was not a, not a, super, not a super thrilling story, but uh, it was just really good luck, I think. Did you have to do any preparation for that, or they just, you know, took you as is and you trained on the job, or did you have a portfolio? Um, I did not really have a portfolio. Um, besides, yeah, besides like papers and and stuff that is not super interesting for that context. Uh, what I did, uh, so they have a pretty interesting um, interview process where, uh, in my case, they gave me a little data set from from Nordstrom data. And they said, take this data set, build a recommendation engine, and then come back and defend it and like present it. And then we'll have a discussion. And, and that's kind of what I did. So that was, uh, it seemed like to me when I think about it now, I was like, oh man, what a, what an easy interview. But when I actually think about what I had to do to do this, I was like, okay, well, I, yeah, okay, I can, I, I'll do this. So I, I get the data and I'm like, well, this will be pretty simple. I think like, I know what a recommendation engine is conceptually. It's not like it's, you know, it's like it on Amazon. And then I sat down, I'm like, I have no idea how these things are made at all. <laughs> like I, I kind of get the idea like, oh yeah, people who viewed also viewed, but like in practice, what is actually going on? So I spent a lot of time <laughs> figuring out like, how, what is the typical way to make recommendations and put something together and I guess it was good enough. But yeah, for the most part, I learned what I needed to learn um, on the job. And how long did they give you to get back to them and what tools were you using? Oh, I think it took maybe, maybe it was a week or two. Uh, it wasn't too long. Uh, I used R for this uh, case because there are a couple good packages in R for doing recommendation systems. And so mm -hmm. it made it easy because all I, all, all I really needed to do was make sure that I put the data in the format that it needed to be to pass into these uh, nice functions. And then it had all kinds of nice plotting abilities. Uh, so it made it really pretty simple. Uh, I wasn't trying to, I was just trying to get something done that I could present, not trying to, uh, you know, like build a production system. So yeah, our work's great. That's cool. So in Data Scientists at Work, you talked about um, a show and tell that you got to do there and transparency between, I guess, when you were presenting what you were doing. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so we had a, um, uh, we had a weekly show, so this was this was a tradition that we kind of inherited from the innovation lab, and for for a while we were actually in the same like room together, and so we had, we shared a, a culture, and it was mostly uh, from the innovation lab that set these um, set up these like these uh, not traditions, but you know practices, um, and so show and tell was something that we did on Friday, which was just kind of like everybody I think got five minutes, and well everybody who wanted to share um, got five minutes. And it's, it's basically your time to talk about what you've been doing. And so that might be showing off uh, just a quick demo of a new feature, or it might be a quick presentation of something you're working on that's maybe unfinished, or even a presentation of something that you're working on that you're now stuck on, where you want feedback. Um, because sometimes it's hard to get, um, it's hard to get feedback on your team, especially if, you're, if it's a fairly large team. 
um, in a way that isn't you don't feel like you're disrupting everyone. And so it's a nice time to, and for people who might not be that familiar with your work also to share what you're working on and get thoughts from people whose opinions you might not normally hear. Um, and just a, like, I don't know, for me, the uh, being forced to uh, present something actually makes it so that I, I don't know, it makes it so that you actually have to think about what you've done and what you're doing. Uh, and so sometimes you can kind of un, unstuck yourself, unstick yourself, uh, just by just by assembling a presentation. So that was, I don't know, that's a really, if I were running a team today, I would definitely, I would definitely do the same thing. It was also great because it kind of enforces uh, like a deadline. So every week we would try to get something together for show and tell, like I just want to get whatever. Like, so you have you have a thing to work towards. Uh, and even if it's a really small thing, if you can accompl like completely accomplish something so that it's ready by demo, then it's just a really nice, uh, like self deadline tool. Yeah, and it sounds like a great way to learn too, because you get to push yourself, but then also see what everybody else is doing. Yeah, definitely. So how was that team put together? Were you, um, did you have a specific function or was everybody kind of picking up wherever, whatever was needed on the projects? Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of both. So we, um, so I was the first hire besides our director under that team. Um, and so we kind of built the team together, uh, which was really cool because I got to do a lot of interviews. I'd never done anything like that before, and it was really fun to build out the team. But we ended up being about uh, literally half and half uh, software, purely software developers and purely data science type people, which uh, for me was phenomenal because I got to work really closely with software developers and learn a lot about software development and how to do it. Um, and then hopefully they also learned something from us. <laughs> I know I learned a lot. I can't really speak <laughs> for whether that was true for them also. Uh, but it was great. And everybody did everything. Um, so all the data scientists wrote production code. I wrote code that was serving recommendations on uh, or creating recommendations for Nordstrom.com. So it, I don't know. It was amazing. It's, that's a very, I think, rare experience for data scientists um, to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, it was great. So what was it like interviewing people for data science jobs? And what did you find out to, that you wanted to end up looking for? You know, after you had several hires, what did you look for in the success, you know, to think that the next one was going to be successful? What were the key things that you spotted? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we did We did the process kind of like we did, like I, like I mentioned that I did, um, so that data scientists kind of, we gave them a harder data set than the one I got, <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> for them. But uh, I think we used the million song data set and asked them to create recommendations based on that. And we chose that one uh, in part because it's a pretty, it's a really big data set. So this is not going to be something you'll be able to work with on your laptop and just uh, use R like I did. Um, you, it would actually uh, impose limitations on what you could do. So part of what we were looking for was um, how are people responding to that and how are people dealing with struggling with data. Um, and it could have been anything. Like you could have chose to sample and just say, well, I'm just going to sample because the data is too large and I, I have a week and I'm busy and I have a job. Or, you know, make simplifying assumptions or restrict a genre, whatever. Like anything was fine um, as long as there was, uh, like, you know, thought, some thought had been given to it and, and they could articulate that. So that ended up being really valuable uh, for us was just having, having a roadblock that was, um, that was big enough to kind of weed out people um, or eliminate people who were so green that they didn't know how to how to deal with it or uh, kind of lukewarm on the job so that they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we built the team and we had more people, we always just kind of looked for uh, people who contributed a skill or a, a technique, or not a technique, but a, mostly a skill set that we didn't have already. Um, and so like uh, Jim Vlandingham is an example of somebody that we hired uh, like maybe midway through hiring who is uh, amazing at data, interactive data visualization like for the web um, and could do stuff in D3 super fast and none of us could do that and we were all really impressed by that. Uh, and so that was an obvious, an obvious hire for us. That's cool. So the recommender that you worked on while you were there that you mentioned in the data science who set workbook was um, a recommending products in complementary colors. So tell us a little about how you did that. And uh, what were the results? Yeah, so that was actually that was 
that was really fun. Um, and I don't know. So my 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 goal, or I guess one of my philosophies, I had a lot of philosophies when I was at Nordstrom, uh, and one of them was to do, um, well, do the dumbest thing that works, uh, and also to to favor methods that are simple to implement and to understand if um, the thing generating the data behind it is sufficiently sophisticated. So in this particular case, the way that there are a lot of ways that you might that you might think to rep or to recommend complementary colors. Um, in particular, there's like lots of color theory, so it's it's really simple to go and like find find triads of complementary colors or whatever, uh, and and that's that's one way. The way that I chose to approach the problem was by looking at the fabrics themselves, and I'm wearing a crazy shirt right now, so it's actually kind of a good example. But if you have, which like we did, a swatch, a high resolution swatch. Um, photo of the fabric, you can actually um, you can actually say what what percent of each fabric is uh, is what in terms of RGB. Um, and so what I actually did was I went through and I I took the most commonly co-occurring colors in the fabrics that we had. And so rather than trying to construct sets of complementary colors, I allowed the um, the designers, the the garment designers. Um, and the textile designers to tell me what are the complementary colors this season. And since this was a thing, like these recommendations get refreshed pretty frequently, this is a thing that as trends and seasons and all these things kind of turn over, which is, you know, turnovers pretty fast in fashion, uh, I don't have to change my algorithm. I don't have to do anything differently uh, because as the fabrics change, my, my recommendations will change too. Um, and that so that is genius. <laughs> And it required almost no work. So yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> so that's also cool because not only are you finding which colors go together that are in style, but you're finding which sets of colors are important um, for fabric. Whereas mm -hmm. if you just went with general color theory, you might be finding stuff that's great for like a website or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they look great together, really cool. but I would never wear those things. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um you also have a post on your blog right now about getting a data science job, which I will definitely link to from the blog post for this podcast. Um, but tell us about becoming a senior data scientist at Zymergen and what do they do and what do you do there? Yeah, so uh, Zymergen is a company that does uh, automated high throughput microbial strain uh, in engineering and improvement, uh, and the purpose is to increase the efficiency of um, producing useful molecules. Uh, so what we do largely is uh, help customers uh, do engineering on microbes. So I might come and I have a microbe that does something that's useful, <laughs> and I want it to do more of that thing. I want it to produce more of whatever molecule, uh, but there, I don't know how to do that or I don't have the uh, infrastructure to do that efficiently. So we have uh, a, a, a factory uh, where we can engineer microbes and, and help customers do that. That's cool. So are you now using what you had learned in your PhD studies? I am, amazingly enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah, so my, my PhD studies were in uh, metabolic research and in particular looking at metabolic networks and trying to find functional patterns um, uh, across lots of different microbial species. So this is uh, all, like ideal really <laughs> for my skill my skill set, which is kind of uh, amazing. So yeah, I'm actually back doing um, biostatistics and bioinformatics stuff again. <laughs> That's so cool. So give us an idea of a kind of project you would do there and what kind of tools you're using. Yeah, so uh, well, largely what I'm doing right now is just helping uh, our product teams understand the, the data that they generate. So they, they create uh, the, these high throughput assays um, and they generate a lot of data. So they just need help at this point kind of understanding uh, what they have and how to use it effectively. And so I've been, uh, largely I've been using R again um, because it's a, my data is not huge for one. Uh, I was at AWS before this, and uh, I basically couldn't use use R at all on anything because the data was so enormous. I don't have that problem anymore. Um, and so R is great for doing quick prototyping, or if, uh, right now what I'm doing on uh, one of my projects is trying out a bunch of different methods, and just seeing which ones work the best in terms of predictive accuracy. So R has, uh, I think, easily uh, 
the richest set of libraries for different um, machine learning methods or even just like traditional statistical methods. Uh, so it's been a great tool for being able to try out tons and tons of stuff, test uh, test the how well things are doing, and, and then choose final models. So for prototyping, really. And are there packages that are really relevant to what you're doing? Are you pretty much writing everything from scratch? I'm writing almost nothing from scratch at this point. Uh, but yeah, there's some great packages. I um, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't live my life or do my job without dplyr. Uh, I use a lot of ggplot too. I use a lot of ggviz now, which is uh, Hadley Wickham's kind of new plotting uh, library, and it's great mm -hmm. for um, doing interactive visualizations uh, th that look fabulous. And so uh, a lot of what I do, um, which is great, I think, for communication, is I use R Markdown. So R, kind of um, not unlike Python notebooks, R has a, a, a kind of notebook view that uses Markdown, but it allows you to embed interactive visualizations um, and do all kinds of kind of rich tools. Uh, and so that's been great for prototyping stuff because then I can really quickly produce um, visualizations or even little models for people to tinker with, and then I can just shoot them a URL and they can access my analysis and interact with it uh, on, on their own time, on their computers, uh, with each other, and then come, and that's been really useful for generating questions um, and just communicating about what I'm doing and what, like, kind of what I can do uh, to, the, to the teams that I work with. So is that what you're doing to help people understand their data sets, is visualizing what's contained in there? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that and also just prototyping future tools. Um, so I'm building some tools to help uh, some people design experiments better. Um, but before I do that, I, it's nice to be able to try a bunch of things and then send them, send them this link so that they can go see what I've done and get feedback from them. So before I actually go and I start building a tool that's going to be completely automated, um, I, can, I, I can communicate basically constantly with the teams I'm building for and make sure I'm actually doing what uh, I think I'm supposed to be doing and what they want me to do. That's cool. So um, what were the hiring processes like for each of those jobs? You mentioned you worked at AWS. Um, was there a big difference as you applied for each of those? Um, yeah, so the AWS, uh, or just Amazon in general, interview process is, is quite different. Um, so at Nordstrom, I was, I was uh, interviewed primarily or almost exclusively by the team that I was going to be working with. At Amazon, you could be interviewed by anybody. So actually, it's more likely that you won't be interviewed by anybody that you end up working with. Um, and that's just the difference in corporate philosophy uh, or whatever. But uh, yeah, so it's quite different. So uh, a couple screenings at Amazon and then an on-site, which is uh, like five to seven uh, hour-long segments with different people um, with questions ranging kind of all over the place to technical, um, to kind of personality or, or uh, interpersonal problem solving type of questions. Amazon's very protective of its culture. And so they, they actually ask a lot of cultural questions and take them really seriously. Uh, I would say as seriously, if not more seriously than the technical questions. So a lot, of, a lot more of that kind of thing than, than at Nordstrom. And what kind of work did you do at Amazon? Yeah, so I was a, <laughs> I was a <laughs> sorry, I was a research scientist uh, at AWS working on uh, S3. So largely what I was working on was trying to understand how customers were using S3. Uh, so what were their traffic patterns in terms of what they were uh, putting into buckets or deleting from buckets or reading from buckets um, with the purpose of helping to make better engineering decisions. So if certain customers have different access patterns, um, then that might imply something about the way that you would choose to store the the data on uh, on the drive. And for people listening that aren't familiar with S3, can you tell us what that is and how does it fit into the spectrum of the all the Amazon tools? Sure, S3 is one of the uh, earlier um, AWS products, and probably if you're using AWS for anything, you're using S3. Um, I would guess so. S3 is just generic, is just blob storage. So. Uh, it's it's like Dropbox. In fact, uh, it is Dropbox. Um, so you you have a file. You can you can even drag and drop it into S3, or you can write it to S3 from a program or from the command line, and then it just lives in a 
you can think of it as it just lives on a hard drive on the cloud. So anything you can access that from all the other AWS services, right? Yeah, that's right. So yeah. So if you're if you're using AWS for big data stuff, a common pattern is uh, that you might pull data from a bucket on S3 into your your EMR cluster or into EC2, do a bunch of uh, computations with it, and then write results back out to S3. And so in that case, you might have enormous amounts of data that you can process and then write out of an enormous amount of data without having to put anything on your computer. It's all, it's all in the cloud. <laughs> so are there any other favorite projects of yours, either personally or in your career, that you want to highlight that we didn't talk about? Hmm, favorite projects of mine. Or even just learning experiences. Um, hmm. Yeah. Well, I've had a lot. I've had a lot of learning experiences. I feel like the the last three years have been nothing but, but learning experiences. I learned a, a ton, like I said, at, at Nordstrom, and that was partially, I think, because it was my first my first real job, really, and also just because of the I got really lucky with the type of team that I was on and the people that I worked with. I just couldn't have asked for a better first job. Uh, learned tons there, um, and then I, I accepted uh, the opportunity to teach uh, at the University of Washington uh, in the School for Continuing Education. I teach a data mining class there, um, and that was <laughs> an insane project and a learning experience, and it's starting again in April, actually, so I need to go freshen that up. But Did you uh, create the curriculum for that? I did. I created the curriculum and all the, and all the materials. In fact, even the, the data sets for it, um, and it was just a lot of work. <laughs> an immense amount of work. I completely underestimated how much work it was going to be. I even knew it was going to be a lot of work, and I still couldn't have imagined how much work it was. Uh, but it was super useful, um, super valuable. I know those methods now better than I ever hoped to, <laughs> hoped to um, because to teach something, you really have to, to know it. Uh, yeah, and actually, I had a. It was a really good experience, and I had a really positive, um, a positive relationship with my students. And I don't know, it, it went really well. And so, I'm excited actually to do it again. But yeah, so much work and so much uh, learning. So you mentioned that's a continuing education education class. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of students did you have, and what were the main topics you covered? Yeah, they were all over the place. So uh, yeah, probably ranging from like 20 years old to 60 years old, um, all different kind of backgrounds and um, mostly non-technical, I would say, or like, yeah, primarily non-technical and not super familiar with um, with working with data or with um, data methods, uh, which was cool in a way because it was kind of a blank slate. And so I, I structured the class as uh, based on one of my favorite classes that I that I took in grad school, which was our like our master's uh, capstone, which was all project based. It was almost like being a consultant. So I gave them three data sets uh, that corresponded to three projects, and they had to do they had to solve a, pro a business problem and write it up, and then that that's that, that was the class. Um, and the projects corresponded to uh, prediction of a continuous outcome. So that was primarily regression methods um, and like the lasso and uh, the other one that, that's escaping now. Uh, and then classification was the second one. Uh, so they learned about trees and they learned about logistic regression and then um, unsupervised learning for the last section. Uh, and yeah, so they learned some some clustering and uh, learned some uh, about the a priori algorithm and market basket analysis in that section too. And what were the learning resources for that? Was it mostly the lectures, or do you have specific textbooks or sites that you recommend? I didn't. Uh, I didn't assign anything to them. I, I gave them lots of free textbooks. In fact, uh, the Elements of Statistical Learning is free online, uh, which is a great resource, and I used that heavily in the class. Um, but mostly, so I made these, uh, I made interactive um, lecture notes, which was dumb, and part of why was, <laughs> I hope you can reuse those. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I can send you the, the link to that, but um, yeah, and so I wanted them to have a resource that they could take with them that would be easy, like they could just bookmark at any time they needed access to lecture materials, because I knew that they wouldn't learn 
they wouldn't be able to memorize or retain everything that we did in the class. We were learning so many things. This was a 10 week class also. Uh, and so I wanted them to have something that they could take away. So like if they were to encounter these things on their job, they could easily go look something up and like the lecture notes have menus and everything so they can, they can kind of traverse based on the topic or based on uh, the chapter. So, so yeah, uh, lots of, lots of materials. And then, there's a whole there's a whole repository for it actually and then lots of um r tutorials too so i taught them r uh because i because i knew i knew that they wouldn't have encountered that yet in the program so this is the class in the business intelligence certification program so i knew it would be kind of like rounding out their tool set and um and also like they just get exposure to so many different kinds of methods with r and it's all one tool all one way to visualize stuff and uh, yeah, I think it was frustrating for them for a while, but then I, I think they kind of started to see the power in it and and see what they could do with it. Yeah, if you can share those links with us, that would be great. Oh, yeah. I'll put them on the blog. Sure. Cool. So um, I guess we can start wrapping up now. Um, we've been talking to Aaron Shellman, and I'm Renee Teat. This is the Becoming a Data Scientist podcast. Um, so how can people find you online? Uh, well, they can go to AaronShellman.com. <laughs> That's my website. Uh, or I'm Aaron Shellman at, on Twitter. Actually, all of my social media things, I think, are just Aaron Shellman. <laughs> so it's not hard. You can just Google Aaron Shellman. It's kind of a weird name. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I love how your website says, data scientists living large is all hell. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, where'd you come up with that catchphrase? <laughs> like a WordPress uh, website and so there's just like if you ever use WordPress there's just like a little description thing and I was like well I don't know I'm like what am I gonna put there I was just tempted to just like write my name but it's kind of lame so I just wrote that as a placeholder and I just haven't really gone back and done I don't have anything better yet so it's just that <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome um, and do you have any parting wisdom for people that want to learn data science <laughs> uh, wisdom I don't know uh, <laughs> Come on, you've done a lot of it yourself. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have wisdom, but I, I do have some op opinions, I guess, and you can mm -hmm. take them as, as you want, interpret them as you like. Um, people, I think, uh, well, I guess I, I think that people um, overestimate what you need to know to get started in this field. Um, and I think they overestimate the value in uh, education, honestly, um, despite having had uh, too much myself. Um, I, don't, I don't really think that you need to go back to school, depending, you know, it depends um, on the person. But for a lot of people, I don't think that you need to go back to school um, to switch into this field. And, and I know a lot of people are coming from other fields and they're trying to switch in instead of kind of coming from like a stats background. And it's kind of a... Um, straightforward transition in that case. But I guess uh, I guess I would advise, unless you absolutely feel it, that you need to go back to school, um, to just try to find uh, try to find places where you can get junior level jobs, data science jobs. And I think uh, be very clear with with people that you are that you recognize that there are skills that you're missing, but that you're passionate about the area um, and specifically what parts of the area that is exciting to you and, and try to get try to get a role a junior level role and get experience because uh, what I found is that even though I have the the background and I do have a lot of quantitative skills I still like the amount of learning I, that was required for me to do on the job was massive and a lot of what I spent time in school learning wasn't really that useful <laughs> um, and so, and, and going back to school is expensive and it takes a long time. Uh, I was in, like, I, I went straight through and so in some ways it, it didn't seem as bad. Like, I, I couldn't imagine going back to school now, uh, but... Yeah, I did it eight years after undergrad. I did my master's and it was hard. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine it. It's, I mean, that's part of what, like, I knew myself well enough to know that if I didn't go right in from undergrad, I would never go back <laughs> because I just n never enjoyed school. Uh, and... I just knew I wouldn't come back, so I just plowed through it all uh, like a Band-Aid. Um, but no, I mean, like, I really think so much of what I learned, so much of what I do day to day, I learned just by doing it and kind of struggling, and, it, and it's very uncomfortable, honestly, and it's hard 
and my the whole time I was at Nordstrom, basically and particularly in the first year, I felt like I was so far behind everybody and was like, I just don't know how I'm ever going to catch up. There's so much stuff I don't know. Uh, like I just felt like I was always I was over my head the whole time, and then you just kind of hit a stride at a certain point where you do know what you don't know but you're comfortable with not knowing things and you're not so green that it's like you don't know anything um and you kind of see where even though even where your limitations are and there are things that you don't know you still kind of see where what you do know is super valuable and you just kind of find the places where they don't have what you do and, and you find a place where where that works um, so anyway, all of that go was, was was really just coming back around to my point, which is if you don't have to, don't go to school. Try to find try to find somebody who will work and mentor you and, and grow and develop your skills. Um, but just be clear that that's what you need that you, that you need somebody to help you develop skills. And do you think most organizations would welcome you coming in and learning on the job a lot? I mean, I think it's inevitable. It's kind of a myth that you're going to find. Like even if you get the most competent person in the world there's so much uh, corporate knowledge or like tribal knowledge or whatever um, that's associated with each job. So like ev everybody to some extent is starting from scratch every time they start a new job. And, it, right. and, and yeah, like the, the time it takes you to, to feel like you're, you know, contributing at the level that you want to be is going to be different depending on the skills you have and like where you are in your career. But um I think if you can if you can find people and like this so this model doesn't work very well if 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 what you're going to do is send out resumes and like hope that hope that somebody's going to reply it, it kind of breaks down but if you can go to meetups if you can find people like and actually commute and talk to people um I I don't know that just seems to work a lot better uh for me and it's I don't know and and you're definitely know that you'll be learning stuff that's useful because it's being used uh and so and you're being paid, which is another huge thing. You're going to get paid for it, and that's 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 important to me anyway. Yeah, I felt in my learning process that the most important thing was to convince myself that I could learn anything. So it's like, okay, I'm, I've got the baseline, and now I'm ready to start learning the next thing. And once I've proved that I could learn some things that were originally really hard for me, and now it's starting to all click and make more sense. Now I feel like you know, I could jump into any environment and start picking up what they need me to know. Yeah, that's so true. And that's like, that I, That also is like a good summary of, of something I've learned only probably since graduating and like joining the real world, um, which is that knowledge isn't, uh, knowledge and your ability to, to get it is not innate and it's a skill just like anything else. It's a muscle just like anything else. Uh, and you get better at it. So like, even if you are, you know, this job requires that you learn all the time but you do get better at learning, and so even if you're kind of starting from scratch in a certain area, you're you're gonna get you're gonna pick it up faster than you did when you were really starting from scratch, just because you got better at learning. And it is like a mindset thing. If you acknowledge that you can learn anything, or you believe that, um, then it does kind of make it true. But it's all about input. Like some things are harder than others, and it will take longer and take more work to do it. But everything I think is is possible. Yeah, I think us data scientists are a tenacious bunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, selection that goes into, you know, getting all the way up, uh, into that career. If you can, if you can tolerate everything that that it kind of entails, then then you're that's probably most of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great to meet you, and thank you for talking with us, Aaron. Yeah, no worries. Thank you.